In this video, we're going to discuss the differences between the three different ELAC models that are very popular, which are the ELAC Debut 6.2, the ELAC Debut Reference 62, and the ELAC Unify UBR 62. This is going to be a shootout style video, and I'm going to present to you some factual information based off the data that I have gotten myself and then paired with some of my listening notes from my reviews. The ELAC Debut 2.0 62, or DB62 for short, is a two-way design that features a 6.5 inch midwoofer and a one inch dome tweeter. The ELAC DBR62 is also a two-way design that also features a six and a half inch midwoofer with a one inch dome tweeter, but this tweeter is in a waveguide. The ELAC UBR62 is a three-way design which features a six and a half inch midwoofer and a coincident four inch driver with a one inch tweeter placed inside. This is a size comparison of the three different speakers. And as you can see, the DB62, which is on the left, is just a little bit taller, but more narrow than the DBR62 in the middle and the UBR62 on the right. The table that I'm providing is for your own leisure. So you can pause this if you want, hang on to this for a few seconds. But to summarize this though, few things. Price of the DB62, 400 bucks per pair. DBR62, $700 per pair. UBR62, $1,200 per pair. Now the sensitivity between all these is within about two dB or so. The F3 and the F10, which help us to understand the base extension of these speakers is also pretty close to the same. And the only real outlier would be the DBR62. And even that is reasonably close to the same. So the base extension on all three of these is very similar. The linearity, however, is a little bit different. And it seems that as you go a little bit higher in price, you do get a little bit more linearity in the response. All the data that I'm about to show you comes from my Clipple near field scanner. This is a state of the art robotic device that allows you to get anechoic data in a non anechoic environment, such as my garage, which you see here. No longer do you need a million dollar or $2 million anechoic chamber. The anechoic data is helpful to determine what the speaker itself is doing because without that information, we're left to guess how much of the room is contributing to what we hear. When we take the speaker out of the room and analyze it by itself, we have a better understanding of why we're hearing what we're hearing. And that's very important. So let's start with the DB62's linearity. As I said, average sensitivity is about 85 decibels and the linearity is within plus or minus 3 dB pretty much throughout. Now there is a resonance around five, six, 700 Hertz or so. And this little guy stands out like a booger. The F3 is at 57 Hertz and the F10 is at 40 Hertz, which means that you're gonna have decent bass extension in a room, but it's not gonna get super low. You're gonna want a subwoofer if you really want strong output below maybe even 50 Hertz. Now looking at the DBR62, we can see that the response is different. The sensitivity is just a tad lower and the bass extension is a little bit different as well. But the thing about the DBR62 is that the bass has a little bit of a bump around 100 Hertz. And to me, I like that. It provided a little bit more impact and a little bit more thump for the majority of my music. There is a dip in the upper mid range area, which will take out some attack out of some music. And then the UBR62 again, Similar sensitivity, about a dB and a half off from the other two. Similar bass response as well. But the thing about this one is that the on-axis response does somewhat trend downward. Not a whole lot, but it is a little bit of a downward trend, which you don't see on the other two speakers. Let's look at the estimated interim response, which we can gather from looking at the on-axis and off-axis measurements of these speakers. This is the DB62. And as you can see, there's that pesky, mid-range resonance. There's a slight dip in the presence region and a somewhat boosted top end. This gives us a better idea of what we're likely to hear. Keep in mind, the thing about these trend lines are I usually would try to draw them through the mid-range. And also what I do is I base these trend lines on what I heard in the room. Now, depending on what you are listening for explicitly, that may drive how you would change the slope of the trend line. So this is somewhat subjective, but you can always go back and look at the data without the trend line to draw your own conclusions. Personally, however, though, this resonance showed up in my listening test and it made things sound a little bit too boxy, a little bit too boomy at certain frequencies, which really is at 700 Hertz. But the other thing I noted in this speaker's listening test was that the top end was just a little bit too bright for me. And that comes from this particular area up here. Sibilant 
possibly, most likely even, but not necessarily airy because by the time you get to the 10 to 12 kilohertz area where the air is, it's more subdued again compared to the mid-range. Now we're looking at the DBR62 and we can see that it's a little bit more neutral. So let's flip back. See this dip right here on the DB62 and the upper end boost of the DB62? We don't really see that in the DBR62. Now the DBR62 does have somewhat of a little bit of a boost when on axis. Now the on axis is in black, 30 degrees off axis, which would be if the speaker is parallel with the rear wall behind it, is in red. Now if I draw a trend line, we can see that in red, if you turn the speaker 30 degrees off axis, it should sound mostly neutral, but there is gonna be a little bit of a takeaway in that one to two kilohertz area, which will take out some presence, but not a lot. And I don't think it's gonna be complete noticeable. And I'm okay with that particular sound. Now, the other thing that I wanna point out is if you continue to draw this trend line from 200 hertz down, you would see that this bass does bump up a little bit. As I said previously, there is a mild hue bass bump around 100 hertz, which gives it a little bit more thump, and I personally like that. Now we're looking at the UBR62, and we can see that it also has a smooth downward trending response from the mid-range through the tweeter area. And if I draw a trend line through this, it looks really quite good. Both on-axis and off-axis response look very good, and if you wanna maybe boost the tweeter level a little bit, you might turn it toward you. If you wanna subdue it a little bit, you might wanna turn it away from you. It will, of course, depend somewhat on your room and your preferences. Now, this based dip right here, it doesn't stand out as annoying, but it does take away some extra little gravity and some weight of kick drums and bass guitars. So if that's going to be a problem for you, keep that in mind. Now, can you EQ something like that out? Let's go back and look at all the CEA 2034 data and come up with a conclusion on that. The CEA 2034 data, we saw the on-axis response in black and the listening window in green in previous slides. So I'm going to skip that. And now really what I want to focus on is the early reflections directivity index down here at the bottom. Now this blue line, the more linear it is, regardless of the slope, but the more linear it is, the more likely you're going to be able to equalize the speaker to your desired sound. So for example, if you wanted to knock down this top end, can you do that? Or if you wanted to take out this resonance, can you do that? Well, the resonance area around 700 hertz, there's a smooth trending line through that. So yes, with the right filter, you could knock that resonance down. If you have a mini DSP, set your cue to, I'm just ballparking here, maybe six, drop it down about three, four, five dB at 700 hertz, and you can resolve that issue mostly. On the top end, can you EQ that down? Well, it's pretty linear through here. And I say, yeah, you could drop that top end down. For the DBR62, if you wanted to tweak it to make it your own sound, could you? Well, let's start off with this particular upper mid-range area where some of the attack may be taken away. Could you equalize that up? Well, not entirely. And the reason I say that is because right through that region, you've got a dip in the directivity index. That also shows up where the listening window has flip-flopped on top of the on-axis response. So that's another indicator that you're gonna have a little bit of trouble equalizing that particular area. But that particular area is really the only area in this speaker that I don't think you'll be able to equalize fully. So keep that in mind. It's also worth noting that with the DBR, some of this discrepancy in the directivity index is going to be due to the vertical distance from the tweeter to the midwoofer below it. And then also some of it is gonna be due to diffraction. In this particular speaker's case, I believe this one was due to diffraction. So that's not something you can quite equalize out. A way that I can check that is I can go back and look at my linearity graph. And down here, I have the early reflections directivity index, but only looking at the horizontal window. So this is not taking into account the vertical directivity. And when I do that, I can say, okay, is that dip still there? Well, yes, it is. Around four kilohertz, that dip in the directivity index is still there, which indicates that this directivity error is due to the horizontal region something going on in the horizontal axis. So now we go and look at the UBR62. Same kind of conditions. Uh, for the most part, it's linear, but there are a couple of areas where it appears there are some resonances here, which you may not be able to equalize. And I don't necessarily know in this data if that's from vertical or horizontal issues. So we'll go back up to the linearity. So horizontally, you're gonna be okay, at least until about seven kilohertz, where there is some sort of diffraction element. Now, I don't know if this is cabinet. Most likely, it's going to be the coaxial tweeter inside the waveguide, which is basically the mid-range at that point. 
And some cases, you're not going to be able to equalize that. You may be able to turn the speaker somewhat off axis just to alleviate that little bit of a dip, but it may not bother you either. So that's something that you'll need to play with when you listen to the speakers. The data will certainly help give you a guide, but it can't tell you everything. Now let's talk about horizontal radiation. The DB62 is about plus or minus 50 to 60 degrees wide and then narrowing above about five to six, let's say maybe seven kilohertz where that dome tweeter starts to beam. The DBR has a wider profile in horizontal dispersion. And so you're getting about plus or minus 60 and maybe as much as 70 degrees and it starts to narrow a little bit higher in frequency. Now the UBR62, which actually surprised me at how well it's controlled and how wide it is. Most coaxial drivers have a more narrow radiation width of about plus or minus 40 degrees to 50 degrees sometimes, which are gonna be in this particular region right here. But this speaker radiates to about plus or minus 60 to 70 degrees on average. To me, that's a really good feature for a coaxial design to have it radiate that wide. And that's really what I like the most about the UBR62. Let's talk about vertical. The vertical polar for the DB62 is more limited than some of the other speakers that we're gonna see. So it's about plus 12 degrees and maybe about minus 20 degrees, give or take. Meaning that if you sit about 10 degrees above that tweeter line or 20 degrees below the tweeter line, it's not gonna sound as good. The DBR62 looks a little bit better. It's, it's closer to about plus or minus 20 degrees vertically. And then the UBR62 has a lot more vertical range where you're actually closer to plus or minus 40 degrees, which means that if you're using these speakers in something like a home theater or it might be height dependent, the UBR62 is the better choice. Let's flip through distortion really fast. 96 dB at one meter for all of these. This is the DB62. And then the DBR62, which looks a little bit better. And then the UBR62, which shows an issue. Now, this issue right here, to me indicates some sort of resonance. I'm, I'm not quite sure what was going on here and I probably would have to go back and deconstruct that speaker, but maybe some sort of resonance or some kind of thing going on with the port that's giving this a little bit of an extra bump, maybe an out of phase cancellation issue. Regardless, did I hear that? I don't think that I did, but it's worth noting that it is there. Now let's talk about compression. Compression for all of these is actually pretty similar and you'll see some similar features, if you want to call it that. So on all of them, you'll note that below about 80 Hertz, things start to go kind of haywire. And this is really no different on the DB62 as it is for the UB62. So the DB62 compression, okay, yeah, below about 80 Hertz, everything kind of starts dropping off. So the frequency response really changes as you give the speaker more and more output volume. DBR62, same sort of thing. And then the UBR62, which actually does look even probably worse, to be honest with you. Now, my takeaway from this and the distortion is that all of these are going to need a subwoofer if you plan to listen loud and or far away. And then that wraps it up for the summary comparison of these three different speakers. So my personal notes, the DB62 at about three or $400 per pair, depending on where you buy it, because sometimes it's, it's relatively cheap is a very good intro speaker to hi-fi. Now, the resonance at 700 Hertz and the boosted high frequency are problematic for me, but considering the price, they're not necessarily deal breakers per se. The DBR62, in my opinion, represents the best value and it really shouldn't come as a surprise. I mean, it is the middle price speaker and usually when you have a series and range of speakers from a particular manufacturer, the middle one represents the best trade-offs. The thing I like about the DBR62 is that it does have decent bass extension. Again, you're going to need a subwoofer, but it's decent. Good linearity and very good in-room response. Just a really nice, smooth trend line. Now, on axis, it's a little bit tilted up, so make sure you turn it off axis to get that best trade-off between the good mid-bass bump, but also not a little bit too much treble. And you're going to want to play around with that. Speaking of mid-bass bump, I really like that. I like the radiation width of the DBR62 as well. It's nice and wide, but it's not too wide for my room. And that's a subjective thing that I really enjoyed. The UBR62 is a more wide radiating speaker. It is a three-way design, so it has better vertical consistency. And if that's important to you, that's a major benefit of that particular speaker. The base extension is pretty much on par with the other ones. The dynamic range is also on par with the other ones. In-room response is also quite neutral even on axis, 
But if you want to turn it off axis, you can tame the top end a little bit more. I don't necessarily think you need to do that. I think the best aiming for that speaker is somewhere between on axis and about 10 degrees off axis. That does it for this review or not even a review, this comparison. I hope you learned something and I hope you take the time to maybe dive into the data a little bit more if you have the ability to do so. If you have any questions, please ask me. Hopefully I've done a good job of explaining some of the trade-offs that I'm seeing in a reasonable amount of time and didn't bore you to tears. Uh, if you plan to purchase any of these, I'll drop a few affiliate links down below. Please consider using one of those affiliate links because that really helps me out a lot to help offset my costs and keep doing what I'm doing and it really is appreciated. Also, please consider joining me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner for behind the scenes looks, polls, and things like that that I enjoy doing with my audience. And finally, if you haven't already, please consider liking and subscribing this video because YouTube's algorithm needs all that information for me to continue doing this at a positive rate. Appreciate you all watching. I'll talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.